Welcome to the Long Thread Podcast about spinning, stitching, and weaving by hand. The podcast is presented by Long Thread Media, publishers of Spin Off, Handwoven, Piecework, and Little Looms magazines. Find us online at longthreadmedia.com. This episode is sponsored by handweaving.net, the comprehensive weaving website with more than 75,000 historic and modern weaving drafts, documents, and powerful digital tools that put creativity in your hands. Now it's simple to design, color, update, and save your drafts. Handweaving.net's mission is to preserve the rich heritage of handweaving and pass it down to you. Visit handweaving.net and sign up for a subscription today. This episode is sponsored by Trainway Silks. You'll find the largest variety of silk spinning fibers, silk yarn, and silk threads and ribbons at trainwaysilks.com. Choose from a rainbow of hand-dyed colors. Love natural? Their array of wild silk and silk blends provide choices beyond white. Trainway Silks, where superior quality and customer service are guaranteed. I'm your host, Long Thread Media co-founder, Ann Merrow. Catherine Ellis is a weaver and teacher whose work has been influential in two different areas, Woven Shibori, which she wrote a book about in 2005, and Natural Dyeing, which is a subject that she has explored extensively over the last decade. She wrote a book with Joy Boutrop called The Art and Science of Natural Dyes, that's an essential handbook and reference on the subject. So, Catherine, welcome. Thank you, Anne. It's nice of you to have me here on this little adventure. <laughs> <laughs> it is absolutely my pleasure. So I first knew of your work with your beautiful book, I think it was in 2005, called Woven Shibori. Yeah, that's... Um... 2005 is when that first book was published. A few years earlier than that, I I guess I went public with the whole process of Woven Shibori. Um, it's something that I developed here at home in my studio, worked on several years all by myself, trying to develop a vocabulary, figure out what the possibilities were, what the limitations were. Um, and what I learned is there are tremendous amounts of opportunity, not just as a resist for dye, but as a means of doing all kinds of things with the textile. So, um, Developing that book actually taught me more about weaving and textiles and materials themselves. So when you say that you could do more than dyeing, mm -hmm. I, I, I should have the book in front of me, but mm -hmm. when, you, uh, when you say you could do more than dyeing, what sorts of things could you do? Well, I learned that I could shape textiles um, mm -hmm. using shibori. Just the t shibori became a tool. It became a tool mm -hmm. for compressing the fabric, and um, then other things could happen. Um, shaping could be done with heat-sensitive materials, such as polyester. Shaping could also be done by using yarns that had either a slight or a very, very strong over twist. Another thing I learned to do at that time was even doing burnout processes using felt resists. It was it was way back in the early 2000s when I was working on a lot of this that I first started working with Joy Botrup at Penland. Uh, Joy and I later on went on to do a um, the book on natural dye, but. Back in those early years, uh, we were teaching together, teaching weaving and dyeing classes at Penland using mostly synthetic dyes at that time. And Joy is a uh, textile engineer and chemist. And she looked at what I was doing and saw all kinds of possibilities for applying those resists. Things like felt resist, intentional shaping, layering of different classes of dyes with discharge. It, it seemed endless almost. <laughs> you say felt resist. What does that mean? Are you talking about felting something after you've woven it or, or does that mean something yes. else? Yes, it, it, it does. Joy and her colleagues at the Danish um, School of Textiles in Copenhagen 
developed a paste. It's a very, very simple paste using sodium alginate and a few other benign chemicals. When applied to wool that would otherwise felt very, very easily, it coated the fibers so that they could not felt. So if I wove my fabric, gathered it as for woven shibori, and then use those gathered threads as a, as an organizational tool, essentially, and use this paste, then I could um, take out my gathering threads. The paste was applied as a dye would be applied in, in a way, but it functioned very differently than I could vigorously wash that textile and it would felt all around those areas that had the paste on it. And, you, you know, then eventually the paste would be removed and you'd get wonderful areas of very dense felt and very open woven areas. So these kinds of textiles were always done with merino wool, very, very fine feltable wool. So one of the interesting things about shibori is that, I mean, of course, there's some sort of resist and dye process mm -hmm. kind of all over the world. But then it depends, do you leave the texture as well? Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you were really playing with texture mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. as color. Yes, yes, I, I, I was. And in fact, one of the times that um, Joy really, really got me looking at yarns themselves is I had some cotton fabrics that I had woven, gathered, dyed, finished, and some of them had a slight texture to them, just little, little tiny subtle bumps where the edges of the pleats had been. I couldn't press them out. I couldn't get rid of them. They wouldn't go away. And then others were just as smooth as could be. And it was a mystery to me. I didn't know. I, you know, I mean, I make cloth. I weave cloth. I dye. I, I wasn't used to looking maybe so microscopically at, at my own fabrics. And Joy looked at it and she immediately said, Oh, it's in the twist of the yarn. So the, where we had little, little textures, the yarn, the weft yarn was slightly over twisted, very, very slightly. And what happened is when the textile is woven and then it's gathered up and the the twist is released for the first time in that gathered shape it forces the release to the edges of the pleats making a permanent texture as subtle as it was but then she gave me the idea to really really push that and work with sure. crepe spun yarn and that became a very very deep textured pleat that was just totally in the twist of the yarn. That's that's it. The fabric could be washed gently, um, but the shape doesn't go away. You know, when I first tried woven shibori myself, I took a class using a rigid heddle. Mm -hmm. And so with a pickup mm -hmm. stick, I could do that. So, um, you know, it's it's you can do a lot of exciting and complex mm -hmm. things, but with that extra dimension mm -hmm. of the gather mm -hmm. and the resist, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's something you could add all over. Oh, uh, it's it's endless. I I honestly think it's endless the possibilities with a structure like that, or or, or an approach to an approach to making cloth and resists. Yeah, it's kind of a cool intermediate step because when you think about shibori and a lot of resist dyes, it's you have your finished fabric mm -hmm. and then you do this, mm -hmm. and and it's something that kind of only a weaver could yes. do. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you, you know, I th I've been a weaver for a long, long time. And I guess I, I used to do a lot of ecot. Um, I liked the idea of transformation. It made things more interesting for me. But the truth is, is I was never capable of the discipline to get the um, uh, the intricate ecots that I admired so much. I, I, I mean, and I was not going to spend my life doing that. I, I I I knew that, but the 
the woven shibori, which came about simply because I spent a whole week stitching, you, you know, um, into a piece of cloth and thought about how I could work as a weaver. And I think that the, the woven shibori has kept me weaving longer than I might have. Um, um, I, you know, as, as weavers, we spend a lot of time planning. We spend a lot of time setting up. Then we sit down at the loom. And in 10 minutes, I'm just, I was ready to be at the end of the, of the, of the weaving. <laughs> and let's just get on to the next idea. But with this shibori, the process isn't done until the textile comes off the loom, it gets manipulated, it gets dyed, it gets treated, it gets heat set, it gets whatever. And then um, you finally get a surprise at the end. I, you, you know, it's just like you've always got a carrot out there, you, you, you know, which keeps you going. And I like to think that it's been a reason why why people might learn to weave so that they can transform cloth in that way. Now, how did you how did you arrive at the shibori term of it? Just because there are so many different, you know, resist dye yeah. opportunities all over the world. What is, what was it about shibori that spoke to you and thought that's kind of what I think. That's 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 what relates to what I do. Well, it, it all started when I spent a, a week at Penland taking a class with Yoshiko Wada. Uh, this was in the early 90s. And it was um, it was about Japanese textile history. And I sat there and listened for a week. And we uh, we saw lots of fabrics. We heard lots of stories. Uh, we built an indigo vat. And I just started stitching Nui Shibori, just parallel rows of running stitches. And so it was, it was all related to the Japanese Nui Shibori, uh, which is the stitched. But I, then I went home and started developing and working on my own part of it um, with, with the loom. And then I remember sitting one day and thinking, hmm, I'm going to have to call this something. I'm going to have to give it a name. And at that point, I had a feeling that whatever I named it was going to stick. I mean, it was, it, it, I wasn't just naming it for myself that day. I, I, I had this feeling that it was going to have a life beyond me. And so should it be, you know, Shibori with a loom? Should it be this? Should it be that? And finally, I just settled on woven Shibori. Yeah. But it's but it's really interesting. At the same time I was doing that in the isolation of my own studio, um, the late Kay Faulkner was doing the same thing in Australia. And she was a weaver and she had a similar but slightly different idea. And um, so she was working on her own version of it. And we met at Convergence in Atlanta in I think 97 when it was when it was held there and we became really really good friends so it, you know two minds were working on the same idea she called it shibori on the loom and I called it woven oh. shibori you know I said earlier that this is something only weavers can mm -hmm. do but that's not strictly true because you worked with a mill to create something so that people who don't weave could still do woven yes. shibori. Yes, yes, I, 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 I did. I, I worked with the Oriel Mill in Hendersonville, North Carolina. Um, that mill closed um, just at the beginning of COVID. It will not reopen, unfortunately. Um, but it, it, it did give me an opportunity to not only weave larger and more elaborate fabrics for myself for Shibori, but also to provide fabrics for others to to use it in, in whatever way they wanted. You know, um, Beth Ann Knudsen, who was the at the brilliance behind that mill. She ran the Jackard Center in Hendersonville for a long time. And she did amazing training in um, jacquard weaving and jacquard software. And when I met Beth Ann and realized she was down there, I mean, just an hour from where I live, I thought, 
oh gosh, I guess I'd better learn this jacquard thing. I mean, at this time I was teaching full time. I'd always resisted it. I mean, it was becoming popular. It was um, so many of the textile artists I admired were learning jacquard, were accessing, you know, weaving. And I thought, well, I guess I'm going to take the step. I guess I'm going to go down there and learn about it. So I went and, you know, arrived to spend the whole week. And there were two other students down there at the time. One was Christy Matson, who had been there many times before. The other one was Cynthia Shira, who had been there many times before. And they both pulled out their files and just pulled out their computers and started working. And I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> None. And I, 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 I hadn't felt so lost in a very, very long time. And I made a decision that first day that, um, okay, I'm not going to weave photographs. I'm not going to weave pictures. I'm going to do something really simple, and I'm going to try to translate this woven shibori thing to the jacquard loom. And that was the smartest thing I could have ever done <laughs> because I didn't have to learn another whole sk- – I mean, there was still plenty to learn – but I got to do something that completely related to my own work. And I wasn't trying to invent myself and weave photographs. Some folks are using the jacquard to be on a smaller scale. But when you were working with the Oriole Mill, you were actually doing something that was, you know, essentially we- weaving for a commercial. Mm-hmm. Your loom was something that was programmed, not just like Adobe is programmed, but like a mill oh, is programmed. Oh, these, these, these were big looms, industrial looms with jacquard heads that, um, I, you know, and, and I was telling all thousands of those threads exactly what to do at every moment. I, you, I mean, the software helps. This was not a hand jacquard loom. This was industrial mm-hmm. production, which which in a way suited what I was doing so well because it helped me just to develop a substrate that was very particular to my own needs with these supplemental threads already woven in. And when I eventually, you know, got into doing natural dyes, I had all of this fabric, really high quality cotton fabric with supplemental threads woven in that I could test and test and test and test so that I could focus on the dye and didn't have to go back to the loom each time, which was a really, I, I, it was such a freeing um, opportunity that, that I had. And, you know, if, if, if I chose to, I could go very, very large. I could weave fabrics that were 60 inches wide, you, you know, and um, and then I could do multiples over and over again. So what was it that sort of clicked and made you interested in exploring natural dyes? Because that's become such a big part of your yeah, work. It has. It, it, it has. Um, I had been using all sorts of dyes in conjunction with my shibori. I was using that dyes. I was doing that dye discharge. I was using fiber reactive dyes, dispersed dyes, depending upon the fibers I was using. And I had been teaching. Um, I taught the fiber program at Haywood Community College for 30 years, and I was getting ready to retire. And I had been doing most of my dyeing there in the school studio. And I was going to be moving home. And I live in the country and I have a well and I have a septic system. And I was facing the fact that I couldn't, I couldn't do those dyes where I lived. You know, I didn't want to, it wasn't a good idea on any level. Um, And I was pretty stumped for a while because you know, I'd been, I'd done a little bit of natural dye over the years, students who had done it. Nothing I had ever done on cellulose worked as far as I was concerned. Um, um, You know, I followed every instruction in every book I had and just got dull colors and it just was totally uninteresting and cellulose is most of what I do. So I was really not knowing how I was going to move forward. And then 
I went on um, a tour with the World Shibori Symposium to France, and we went down to Provence, and we were in the studio of Michel Garcia, and he did a demonstration for us with simple shibori, and he applied wardens to cotton, and he dyed in weld, and he dyed in matter, <laughs> and they were really, really brilliant, brilliant colors. And I realized then and there, there's a lot that I don't know. I, you know, and um, thus started my adventure to to learn, you know, and so I had the opportunity to study with him on several different occasions. I just came home and worked in the studio with great tenacity. This was this it was really good having fabrics that were woven at the mill that I could experiment and do all kinds of things with because I just had to test and test and test and test. And it was finally Joy Botrip once again who helped me to make sense of all of that. I, it, it, you know, because I felt like I was just, I, I was all over the place, you know, when there was no clear resource for me. I, yes, I had amazing opportunities to work with Michelle. Michelle always just wants you to go home and work on your own too, which is, which is <laughs> what I did. But I needed, I needed a more objective explanation of what was happening. And, and Joy was able to give that to me. And so, you know, I didn't look back. I haven't used synthetic dyes since 2008. They're gone. <laughs> so you had an international collaboration around something that's traditionally, that's completely hands-on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. How lucky have I been, huh? Yes, Mm-hmm. I've had, I've had amazing colleagues and amazing teachers, and um, there's been such a generosity of spirit in people, you know, earnestly trying to learn how to use natural dyes in the best way possible, you know, and and I think it's my job to you know, to continue to be generous too and and pass that on because we all want to do the best dying we can. So you mentioned having tried out and worked out of a whole variety of books and not really found Mm -hmm. what you wanted, you know, and you and Joy wrote a book that, that I think is just sort of the manual for pretty much anybody about using natural dyes. Mm -hmm. How did that kind of come about? What made you decide, in addition to pursuing my own art in weaving, I want to write this very technical book? Well, Joy and I are both teachers, you know, and this is how we came together. First as student, me the student, her the teacher, and then we came together, we were both teachers. And it just seemed like the natural Thing to do. It was the book that I needed and wanted back in 2008. And um, weavers and dyers, natural dyers, are not necessarily really technical scientists. But Joy has a way of explaining the science in a way that I can understand it. I just knew that others needed that as well. You, you know, the, the deal was Joy could have written a much more technical book on her own, but I had to understand it, you, you, you know, and I had to say it in words that made sense to me. And she corrected me over and over again. And sometimes she corrected the same things over and over again, but it finally got drummed into me, you know, what we were talking about. So we're both teachers. For a book that comprehensive, how long did it take the two of you to put it together? Um, Once we signed a contract with Schiffer, the publisher, it was a year, but we had done significant work before then. Um, I'd been working at it pretty steadily for a year or more. So you knew that this was going to be a thing before you actually had a contract in hand. You just yes. knew that this was something that the world needed. I did. I I I, I did. And um, and in fact, in two thousand and fifteen, um, working with Interweave, we did a second edition of the Woven Shibori book. And that was all then focused on natural dye. So I was sort of well 
into this. I mean, it wasn't nearly the, you know, as in depth as what I was doing with joy for the natural dye book. But so I, by 2015, I was in the mode, I guess, of writing about natural dye. And what was the most challenging part of putting that book together? Was it the technical elements? Was it figuring out what to put in and leave out? That's a good question. Probably what to put in, what to leave out. Um, I All of my applications for dyeing um, are as a weaver, really. And what this book required was applications for printing. And I'm not a printer. Um, I sort of had to get over that, <laughs> the fact that I wasn't a printer, and do some things that were pretty simple, um, just really breaking it down. Um, I used, I did block printing. I did silk screens. I, you know, Joy is a printer. I mean, that's the interesting thing. She is, but I was the one doing all the samples for the book. So I sort of had to get over my fear of using skills that I wasn't necessarily comfortable with, but there were principles that needed to be illustrated. So it's interesting. I, I Quite a while ago, I spoke with um, Charlotte Kwan of Maiwa, mm -hmm. and she had been a commercial printer. Mm -hmm. That was her profession. Mm -hmm. But because she was working with these chemicals, she had to stop, and she, she can't be a, a printer of that sort anymore. And so that's what took her to natural dyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so. right, right. She has a really compelling and long story. She does. Mm -hmm. So if we could just go back to the question of weaving for a second, you mentioned that the software was was helpful uh, when you were working with the Jacquard loom, are you talking about standard weaving software or is there something special? No, no, this was commercial, um, commercial software that was written for the industry. This was mm -hmm. Jack Cad software. It was a company that Beth Ann Knudsen worked with for a number of years doing training in mills. And um, so we were using industrial software that was very, very dense. And um, I, so that's another reason I was really glad that I ended up doing something mm -hmm. rather simple with it. Yeah. Well, that makes me wonder about using weaving software for woven shibori because it's a kind of a different application. Do you typically work with weaving software? Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I do. I, I work on a, um, a Dobby loom. I have a 16 shaft Dobby loom and it's computerized. And so I work with just really basic software to help me keep track of all of that. Yeah. So how does that work? I mean, it, I, I'm not a, an expert weaver. I, I'm not a a shaft weaver at all. But when I see weaving software, typically what I see are things that are much sort of two dimensional. How do you use that sort of, you know, whiffs and that, that mode to think about fabric in three dimensions? Um, but you're making a two dimensional cloth initially. Mm -hmm. Most of my fabrics are plain weave. Mm -hmm. It's a ground of plain weave, and then there are supplemental wefts or supplemental warps, and they're just riding on the top or riding on the bottom. So it's, you know, I'm using twills, I'm using overshots, I'm, you know, making up weaves. I'm, um, and in a lot of ways, you can break many, many, many rules. I, you know, as long as you have that, that, underlying structure, which might be a plain weave, it might be a twill, um, you can do anything with your floats. So you're, you're using the software to keep track of where those floats are, how long they're going to be. And oftentimes they're much longer than they would be in a, in a textile where the floats remain as part of the fabric because because they're just a tool. They're a tool to gather it and pleat it and um, make a resist. But how do you know what it will look like when you tighten those <laughs> supplemental weft threads? <laughs> you do lots and lots and lots of samples. 
<laughs> you don't. You don't. I didn't for a long, long time. Um, and still, I'm surprised sometimes you do a lot of samples and you test and you try and you keep track and, um, and then you, you know, keep going back to some things. Because sometimes those supplemental wefts will, will create a resistance to something that is, you know, a a curve or, you know, if you're Mm -hmm. looking for Mm -hmm. in a lot Mm -hmm. of projects, you're looking for, Oh, not, not too long of a float. I don't want it to snag on something, Mm -hmm. but for woven should worry. Sometimes you want a long float for, Oh, you do. You, I mean, the floats are often exaggerated. You know, they're much, much longer. Sometimes I have floats that floats that are eight inches long. You, you, you know, and it's it, the floats are tools. The floats are tools to shape and manipulate the cloth as a first step for dyeing or shaping or whatever it is that I'm doing. You break a lot of rules. I bet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I bet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. When you were, you know, teaching for all those years, mm-hmm. how did that work to pursue your own weaving interests at the same time that you were facilitating students learning about and following their fiber arts interests? That's how I kept vital. You know, if if I wasn't doing work on my own, I wouldn't have been a good teacher and I wouldn't have been setting an example for anyone either. I I mean, sometimes it was hard to find the hours in the day to do it, but, um, but I did, um, I, you know, the program I taught, it was full time. It was five days a week. It was, you know, I was there all day with students, but I used my own time and, um, and I, and I think, I hope I set an example of what focus means, you, you know, focus and repetition and making mistakes and redoing and, um, because they witnessed a lot of what I did. Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. And you are still teaching just different groups. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. 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 I, you know, once I retired, I started doing more traveling and teaching and, um, of course, most of that stopped, you know, a couple of years ago when I'm, you know, easing back into it a little bit, but, um, I, you know, I am slowing down. <laughs> I'm definitely slowing down at this point in time. And when you're working in your studio, what sorts of things are you exploring now? What's, what's your new creative path? Well, the thing that I've been working on really hard um, the last couple of years is predictable color Mm. with natural dyes, Um, using a really excellent palette of colors, very, very few dyes, actually, just the really good ones, Mm. um, and um, learning how to mix them more effectively to create a very deep palette. And um, I, and then applying that to my own work as as well. I, I just finished another project for Schiffer um, with their putting together a, a, a box of recipes. Basically, it's the recipes from the book. But I wanted to add something to that. So what I worked on is um, a whole series of color mix cards, really controlling depth and shade by the amount of dye and what happens when you mix colors and controlling all of those shades of indigo so that, you know, you can get a whole range of greens and a whole range of violets. And, and so it's refining skills. That's what I'm working on right now. You mentioned that you are now on a well, and speaking of predictable colors, it's one thing to have something be predictable in your studio and something else to to think, how will this be predictable when there's a different dye stuff or a different water type? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, you know, I am very, very fortunate to have excellent water where, where I am. Um, but I don't always have that excellent water when I go and teach. Just uh, last month, I was up in the Northeast um, at Sanborn Mills. And I, I mean, they have wells, they have really nice water, all of that. 
But whatever that water was, it was not suitable for cochineal, which seems to be oh. like the canary in the coal mine some, sometimes. Huh. It's much, much more sensitive. I mean, it could, be, it could be that something is in that water or something is not in that water. But we got fine results when we used distilled water, but the tap water worked beautifully with everything except for cochineal. So you sort of have to be prepared for that sometimes. When people are doing natural dyeing, do you recommend that they go and have their water tested to figure out what they might be dealing with? Yeah, no, I don't. I, I, I've i never had my water tested. I I, I use it. There are some some things that I do, and then I just make observations. You can easily test to see if your water has iron in it, which would be a very, very, very sad, difficult thing. Um, but it's really good to know if your water has um, is acidic or if it's alkaline. Uh, you, you know, because you can adjust things one way or the other. There is advantages and disadvantages of both of those things. And sometimes, you know, the dying the dying that you do is simply a reflection of where you are and your water as well. You, you, you know, it's all part of the story. It, it, it's, it's a part of the colors that come out of your studio. But it is, it is disconcerting to go someplace and think you're going to get all of these wonderful Koshigo colors and then they just told, but we figured it out and, and there is a solution. So it was okay. You mentioned, uh, you know, predictable colors using natural dyes, just the good ones. What natural dyes are those that you that are just that are the good ones? One of the things that's been such an inspiration to me the last couple of years is a small book that um, Dominique Cardon uh, did with her daughter. Um, I think it came out in 2000, and it's the um, it's the color work of Genot, who was a uh, he was an 18th century wool dyer in France. And what um, Dominique and her daughter have done is reproduced all of those colors and the formulas that they used to get them. Now, these were professional dyers, and there are 40-some-odd colors in there. Now, all the formulas are there. Um, there were only four dyes in the, whole, in the whole group. Indigo. But indigo is just, it's really controlled, you know. And this is what made, this little book is what made me realize that I needed to become a better indigo dyer and I needed to predict and control different values. I mean, most indigo dyers, they're just happy to get dark or happy to get blue. But I wanted the light to the dark and all the steps in between. So um, it, there was ind um, indigo, matter, a root. I grow it. I grow my own matter root. I also, you know, purchase some, but I, but most of what I do for my work, I grow weld as a source of yellow, and I grow all of my weld. Um, I, I grow it and dry it. It's one of the most light, fast yellow dyes there there is. And cochineal, you know, because it's a very different red. And I've used cochineal that I brought back from Peru. And, um, and those are the four dyes that Chanel worked with. And I, I, you can pretty much make anything with them. I, I, you know, I mean... When I was using synthetic dyes, I only had primaries, you know, I'd have four or five primaries sitting on the shelf and I could make any color with those primary dyes by careful, careful mixing. And um, it really is the same with natural dyes. It's just there are some more steps, though. Yes. <laughs> you, know, you can't just mix up stock solutions and, and, and use them like you would with fiber reactor dyes. But the variety of natural dye stuffs all around the world is just amazing. My husband was in uh, Yonaguni, Japan recently, and they get their dyes from Atlas Moth Poop and the Happy, <laughs> the happy Plant, which is just <laughs> astonishing. Yeah, they're... There, you, you're right. There are dyes all over the world. There are, you, you know, and, and people worldwide 
use what's available and what grows in their area. And there is such a resurgence amongst dyers everywhere. And people are out there foraging and growing and having a really, really wonderful time doing it. But I'm also looking at dye longevity too. You know, that's the responsible thing for me to do right right now is look at the dyes that are going to last a long time and be worthy of use on artwork. Um, I, yeah, maybe it's not as much fun as going foraging and, you know, picking flowers and all of that, but it's, I've just sort of taken it as my challenge. And that's where, you know, indigo, cochineal and matter and mm-hmm. weld and weld are, <laughs> you know, found everywhere and they, they do last a good long time. Yeah. 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 They're the, they're the classics. Um, I mean, and basically they're the European classics. Mm, I mean, yeah. they, 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 they really, they really are, you know, you go to India and it's a different set of classic dyes. Um, mm. But you have to draw a line somewhere, right. you, you know, and make some limitations for yourself. And I, and I really found a lot of inspiration in this little book of Jeannot's colors. Mm-hmm. And it, it challenged me to explore different combinations of those colors and different depths of shade uh, much more extensively than I had done before. Um, I, you know, sometimes we're just happy to get a color, but boy, those pale yellows combined with indigo or combined with something else really makes some pretty special, special colors. So how much would you say that your current work is about experimentation versus having in mind a, a finished project? I'm thinking of some, some wall hangings that you had that had some, um, some, some weld and indigo and a, and a woven shibori set of sort of circles. How much time do you spend experimenting and documenting versus making something that you think is actually going to be a finished art piece? I'd say about 50, 50, and maybe more of it is spent on experimentation. Mm-hmm. Um, over the last couple of years, I put together a body of work that really grew out of doing a lot of samples, you know, and you get reach a point where you say, okay, enough of these, you know, four inch samples, I need to go bigger, I need to hone my skills, I need to go bigger, I need to do applications, you know, I got to go back to the loom, I've got to do all of this. But essentially, I was weaving samples, they were just bigger, and they became finished pieces. And, Mm -hmm. And right now, most of that whole collection is at the University of Kansas in an exhibition. Oh. Uh, you know, so until the end of the month. So, um, and when I got all of that work together and looked at it, I thought it needed to be seen somewhere that natural dye is being taught and taught seriously, because I wanted serious students of natural dye to be able to see what's possible Mm -hmm. in the application of it. And uh, Marianne Jordan has been working really hard to make natural dye an integral part of that curriculum there. They've got a garden. They're they're just doing really good work. So that was a natural fit. So that's where the work is right now. Where else could people see your work? Well, um, some of that work will be at the Appalachian Center for Craft at the end of next year. Um, I, you know, I don't show a lot. I, you know, I mean, that's just the truth of it. I'm, I like the working more than, more than anything else, but, but I don't know. I'm thinking seriously about that one right now and I don't have a final answer. So somebody actually might have more luck coming to find you in a class than in a gallery. Mm -hmm. Oh Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, teaching has been my focus, not showing work. Mm -hmm. I made that shift a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for for sharing your explorations and joining us today. Oh, you are very welcome. It's been really fun to talk with you today. Thanks to Trainway Silks and Handweaving.net for sponsoring this episode. Thank you for listening to the Long Thread Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate the show and leave us a comment on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Thanks again. Bye.